Now, these two drawing techniques to avoid using are not drawing techniques that you'll see taught on YouTube videos, and yet they are amongst the most common and popular drawing techniques that I see used in drawings on social media over and over again. And yet I truly believe they sabotage the appearance of every drawing that they are used in. Are you using them? Let's see. I'll start by doing a quick drawing of this cottage, which will use the two techniques I want to illustrate as not being very helpful techniques to use for the overall appearance of our drawing. Now look, I am exaggerating these techniques a bit because I want to make really clear what they are and I want to illustrate some of the shortcomings of them in this and in a few other diagrams I'll do. But at the end, I'll also show you a proper, if you like, drawing of this cottage, or at least one that uses the techniques I would use and which I will be illustrating in this video as ones that I think provide a much better result. Now, the two techniques I want to talk about are the techniques of drawing through patterns, using patterns in our drawing. And the second one is drawing through symbols, using symbols to represent things that are in our drawing. Rather, of course, for both of them, than what we're actually seeing. We'll consider the first one first, patterns. And so if you have a look at my drawing, how many patterns can you see me using to create the effect of the scene? And possibly, how effective do you think they are? It might be interesting when you compare this with what I show you at the end with a more considered technique. It seems that patterns are most often used as a technique for tackling otherwise overwhelming seeming detail. And so bricks are a great example of that. Now these aren't actually bricks. These are stone blocks that are larger than bricks, but we'll take them to stand for bricks at this point. The most common pattern for bricks is And you see this pattern, I would call it, applied to many walls in many drawings. The problem with having a pattern is that once I have a pattern, the temptation is to outline the shape that the pattern has to go into and then just to draw the pattern in. And because I'm drawing a pattern, not what I'm actually seeing, it's so easy not to observe carefully because I've already decided that I'm just going to do this. And I'm no longer looking to see how many rows are there in fact for each height of the wall. What's the foreshortening of the brick width as we go from one end to the further end, whether it's on this wall or whether it's between here and here? How much are the bricks foreshortened as they move across? I'm not thinking of that because I've actually stopped looking at my reference. I'm simply applying the pattern and it becomes harder to make sure that the perspective angles of this view of this subject also follow their proper angles. So what happens, the overall effect of this is to often change the scale of what we're looking at because the bricks are invariably too large, not too small, and to flatten the three-dimensionality because the pattern is basically the same on every surface we apply it to. The lines of the coursework aren't being molded into the correct perspective angles to create a sense of three dimensions. Let's see how what I'm talking about looks in a few other drawings. In this drawing, you can see that the brickwork is just suggested in a few places. Now, this is a ramshackle building which is sagging and leaning in various parts of the wall. And so the perspective lines of the brickwork don't, in this case, line up in straight lines. But this is an example of what I talk about of creating the effect of what we see, not drawing the detail. 
I do the same thing in this brick building where the bricks are actually very small from the distance we're looking at this building from. And so I really just want to suggest, and I suggest more from how close the courses are. I don't need to emphasize the horizontal lines and vertical lines equally. Often with bricks from a distance, it's better to do very thin light lines in just a few places. And it's best just to do a few places because we're trying to suggest the detail. But also, it's not that easy to do long lines very close together at the right perspective angle and keep it all looking consistent. And sometimes I've done a few hatching lines to suggest discolored bricks, where the bricks perhaps have gone mouldy or absorbed water and become damp. But if I do suggest coursework, I have to keep the perspective angles, particularly of the horizontal lines, consistent with the perspective angles. And I find a good technique is to use greater detail for the parts that are closer than the parts that are further away. But the important thing is to pay attention to the scale of the bricks for the size structure that we've got. And when we do suggest a whole brick to make sure that the scale connects with our reference. Because when I go, oh, a brick wall and just start doing a pattern, I'm not connecting it with my reference. So my advice would be that instead of using a pattern to draw overwhelming detail, instead draw the effect of the detail. Let me show you a few more examples. And we might take the example of this tree here. Many trees I see end up using this pattern for the tree canopy, for the foliage. And it seems to come from the dilemma of knowing that there are millions of leaves with millions of edges and trying somehow to draw them all when we have a, only a line with which to do it. Now I have a playlist on drawing trees, which I would really recommend if you think some of your trees look as though they're more drawn by pattern than drawing the effect of the actual tree. Because even when trees are really this shape, this is not the best way to represent what we're seeing. We need to find other marks than just a pattern. What we want to find are marks that more accurately represent even relatively subtle moldings of the canopy. And it doesn't matter whether it's a small tree or a large tree. What we want is to create definition of the form of the canopy, of the shadows of the canopy. There doesn't even have to be much canopy at all. But what we want to do is to create the effect of the foliage. And I'll just jump to symbols for a moment while we have trees here, because this ends up becoming a bit of a symbol for evergreen trees. Rather than looking at exactly what sort of tree am I looking at, it's easy to jump to a shape that more represents the notion of a tree than any actual tree. Actual evergreen trees can look very different. And in our drawing, we need to capture that difference. They are not all like dish mops. We see trees reduced to symbols also when it comes to fir trees or pine trees, where the overall tree looks more like this than anything else because we see, oh, I know what those trees look like and how you draw them, we draw them like this. When even if there is something approximately accurate in this sort of silhouette, this sort of symbol of a fir tree, in reality, there is far more subtlety to create the effect of the fir tree. And of course, other fir trees really look completely different. And it's the same with pine trees as well. When I use patterns for foliage and when I use symbols for types of trees, I end up with very bland outcomes. The same is true of palm trees, which often end up being drawn more symbolically like this than what we actually see. 
even in a palm tree that does look a bit like this, we need to remember that the fronds come out in 360 degrees. It's not just sideways. They don't just come out on each side and straight up. Some come towards us, some come diagonally away from us, some come to the side. But as soon as I switch from drawing what my reference is saying to a symbol combined with a pattern, such as this zigzag line for the fronds, I've stopped paying attention to my reference and I lose all the detail that makes it look realistic. And of course, there are very different types of palm trees as well. But if I draw using symbols and patterns, when I see, oh, that's a palm tree, I know how I draw those and I stop looking at my reference and I don't observe what I need to observe to have any chance of drawing them effectively. The other problem I get when I draw trees either using patterns or symbols is that they all end up looking the same, which is not useful when to understand a scene a tangle of lines, we have to create differentiation between various parts of the foliage. If we just have a foliage pattern, then it's going to be very hard to tell the difference between where the ferns give way to shrubs, give way to trees, and where we have different types of trees whose foliage is represented in different ways. And this can be in a tangled scene, or it can be in the Palace of Versailles, where we have a range of trees going from shrubs to small trees to large trees further away, larger trees further away again, and pine trees much further. The only way I'm going to capture the effect of drawing these different trees is to forget about patterns and symbols for trees and look carefully at my reference and work out what marks will create the effect of these trees. This scene would really just be a mess to draw if I couldn't create a distinction between this hedge, this bush, this large tree here, this fir tree here, this different type of fir tree here. Sometimes it's a relatively simple thing to capture the effect of the foliage that we see and the fact that one tree is different to another tree, to another tree. But if I'm in the habit of drawing patterns and symbols, I will not develop the observation skills to draw my foliage with more subtlety and effectiveness. Another subject where often patterns and symbols are used to draw them is grass. Or, if it's a larger tuft of grass, and this becomes either a pattern or a symbol for grass. And so when we have grass in a reference, we think, oh, it's grass, and we go to apply our grass pattern or add a few of our grass symbols. Very seldom is this effective. This was a drawing I did of just a lawn looking from close in front to the far distance, trying to capture the effect of all of this grass because there was no way I could draw it. I was also trying to capture the effect of distance. And the way we draw grass is often really important for establishing a sense of depth in our drawing. And when we just start to do a pattern, just as it is with the bricks, it can have a very flattening effect because usually our pattern doesn't get smaller and simpler fast enough, which has the effect of somehow bringing everything closer to us than it should be. So in this more panoramic view, we have these grasses. Now these aren't lawn, these are probably knee-high grasses here in the front. But instead of trying to draw any particular clump of grass, I'm trying to capture the effect, which is not just the effect of any one bit of grass, but it's the effect of the grass going off into the distance. So simply plopping symbols 
into my scene won't do. I have to observe my reference carefully, see the effect that the grass going off into the distance creates and then try and capture it. Or maybe the grass is higher and maybe a lot of vertical lines is a fairly effective way of creating the effect as long as we don't overdo it because it also becomes a place where we can capture shadows in the grass and therefore add to the three-dimensionality of our drawing. And the drawing doesn't have to be complex. Here's a very simple, very gestural line drawing where the grass is just suggested. And you can see we have various trees that have also been very gesturally drawn, but with no hint of symbols or patterns, rather shapes and marks that suggest individual trees. Let's go back to our drawing and a very common symbol for a window and a very common pattern for a window. The symbol is that windows look like this. And they look like this almost regardless of where we look at them from. And the pattern is that every window has inky black behind it. And this is simply not true. Exactly how light or dark the space behind a window is depends on whether there are blinds or curtains behind the window and what color they are. It depends where the sun is. It depends on the distance we're observing from. Sometimes the effect may be to create darkness behind every pane. But at other times, we get certain patterns cast by the struts that hold the window panes in place. Or different shadows are created if we have flat lines behind those same window struts. But if I look at my reference and go, oh, yes, windows, and I simply do all my windows the same, then I lose the chance to get the flexibility, the variety, the, the lifelikeness that we can get through our windows that take into account shadows as well as the architectural form. Because in fact, windows aren't just outlines that almost could be tape stuck on the building, colored in in the center of the squares. Unless we're looking dead straight on at a window, then we're seeing something of the architectural framing of that window. And depending on the closeness and the size of the window, we may see a lot more as well. We don't want to rush to make our windows look like this or our hedges and trees look like this. Whether we're using tone or whether we're using hatching, creating a lighter effect behind some windows that perhaps are having more light bounce off them because they're more central and they're higher than lower down windows that are in different parts of the streetscape helps create just a visual liveliness that adds interest and realism to our scene. Now, another area in drawing where we often see symbols being used is with people. There were no people in this street scene, but the sort of thing I'm talking about as a symbol is this. Although sometimes they look even less realistic. Now, I think symbols for people can work really well in architectural drawings where the aim is not to capture a scene realistically, but to showcase the architecture. And so we have, if you like, more ghost or wraith-like figures, often ones that we can see through, that are important for the drawing because they give a sense of scale to the building, but they certainly don't create a sense of real people there. But I often see shapes that don't bear as much relation to an actual figure, even as these ones do. The better way is to look at our reference carefully at the scale, at the, the size that we need to actually draw the figures and to create the effect of the figures. And that is different if they're further away, where I can get away with far more suggestive shapes, particularly if I draw one or two closer ones 
a little more clearly with a little more care. I have a few videos that describe my technique, my thinking for constructing these figures. And exactly what you draw depends on the scale. If the people are closer, we need to add a bit more detail and so forth. But again, as we go further back, we can become very suggestive in what we draw. Sometimes the figures really are though quite close and we need to bite the bullet and just make more effort to work at capturing the form. But even when that's the case, as we go into the distance, I'm drawing the effect of a crowd rather than the exactness of a crowd. And sometimes shadow can be used quite effectively to enable us just to create silhouette forms that can work better than our ghost outlines do. Another area where patterns are often used is in stonework as opposed to brickwork, where we have rougher stones such as used in these stone walls or possibly in castles. And again, the temptation is to look at our reference, to look at a small part of it and go, oh, okay, I see the pattern. And then we apply the pattern everywhere. And yet there's no regard for how what we see changes for distance or for changing direction. So for instance, the way the stones look on this corner and the visual impact on the stones as they move further away and become foreshortened. Or the fact that the stones we have here on the straight section are not the same shape and not laid the same way on the corner. Because I've gone, oh, stones, and I've begun to draw a stone pattern, I've now stopped observing my reference. I've stopped trying to create the effect of the stonework. Sometimes we can get away with drawing very little actual stonework, but creating the effect of it. If we're looking from a distance, we can just do a few marks to suggest the very large stone blocks that make up the castle wall. But we can use different marks also to represent the stone blocks on this French fort compared to the more weathered stone blocks on this harbour embankment. And if the stones themselves are even more irregular and if you like roughly laid as in this Scottish castle, then we want to try and capture that too in the marks that we make and the effect that we create. And if we do have a wall, it may just mean that because of where it is in our scene, we actually need to draw it carefully, where we're not so much suggesting, but where we're basically drawing each stone to create the effect. But you'll notice I didn't have to draw every stone block in the building behind to create the effect. And I didn't have to draw every leaf in the tree to create the effect. And I didn't have to draw every blade of grass to create the effect. We talked about grasses, but just generally the ground is another area where I see a lot of symbols and patterns used. We end up just doing a series of fairly meaningless lines that usually create no realistic effect at all and visually just confuse whatever perspective is actually happening, especially if I combine it with some grass symbols. As we saw already, because the ground can slope away a long way, creating the effect of distance with our marks is a really important consideration. And when we start plonking down symbols and patterns, Without careful reference, we almost invariably will draw too much, too large for the distance to create the effect that we're really wanting. Once we start going some distance, we really don't need any marks on the ground unless they're structures such as fences or buildings or trees perhaps. Even when the ground is relatively bare, the challenge is still looking carefully at our reference to create the effect of what we're seeing. And the effect of distance is usually so important when we're drawing the ground. These are all drawings from videos where I explain in detail the technique that I'm using and the marks I'm making to create these effects. The ground can actually be a major consideration in our scene. 
And again, it's always with careful reference to our scene, working out how to capture the effect of the distance with the sorts of vegetation that's on the grass. And in this case, how it's catching the early morning light. And you can see here again, the importance of being able to capture foliage in different ways for different types of trees and bushes. All of this subtlety is lost when we jump to patterns and symbols. So how does this scene look? How does this scene look? When I draw it, focusing on my reference and using marks that create the effect of what I'm seeing. I've actually drawn this a few times for different reasons, but in this drawing, it ended up looking like this. I spent a reasonable amount of time on the stonework because it is Yorkshire. The stone, the visual effect of the stone is important. You'll notice that sometimes I'm drawing the lines between the courses and sometimes I'm drawing the actual stones themselves. Creating variation is really important in avoiding what can look fine in the reference photo or in life, but in a drawing can look like a lot of dull repetition. It also helps the eye focus just on parts where there's more detail and then to bounce to other parts where there's more detail. And anything that moves the eye around our scene, I think is a great thing to do. Again, with this grass, I'm trying to capture the effect of the grass with a variation of marks, even within a certain similarity that goes way beyond what we get when we use symbols and patterns where we tend to consolidate into just a few types of marks. And when we look at this scene, it's the cottage that stands out. Do you think you've slipped into a technique of using pattern and symbol? G'day, I'm Stephen Travis. Look, I hope you found this helpful. I'm really not trying to be critical of people here, but in the drawings I see over and over again from people who really do want their drawings to look more realistic, this issue, these techniques of drawing using symbols or patterns instead of observing carefully and creating the effect of what we're seeing, I think is the biggest barrier to getting the breakthrough in results that they're wanting to have. So look, I hope this is helpful for anyone who's also wanting that sort of breakthrough in their drawing. But look, whatever you draw, however you draw it, and quite frankly, however it turns out at the end, make sure you have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.